this is some sort of hysteria. And this hysteria never seems to stop. Maybe someone has a pill that is going to cure this hysteria. There is an irony in the propaganda that the Russians meddled in the recent election in order to undermine the public's confidence in our democracy. The irony, of course, is that it is the noise about how the Russians meddled in the election which undermines the public's confidence in our democracy. Propaganda is essentially an exercise in social psychology. It is a method of persuasion used to influence the emotions, opinions, and actions of target audiences for ideological or political purposes through one-sided messaging. It relies on the communicator's credibility and perceived expertise and the recipient's interest in the subject. It is generally camouflaged and cast in a we versus some enemy narrative. And so it is with this Russian meddling story. The propaganda is hidden in the network and cable news shows. These broadcasts strongly emphasize that Russia is our enemy. Many purported experts and serious people assure us that Russian malevolence is real and a threat to the American way of life. And of course, the story has political purposes. For example, Hillary can't stop making excuses for why she lost to Trump. One of the most prominent excuses is that Russian hacking led to fake news. She implied that this caused people to change their votes. Did we make mistakes? Of course we did. If the election been on October 27th, I'd be your president. I was on the way to winning until Russian WikiLeaks raised doubts in the minds of people who were inclined to vote for me. Hillary's evolving Russian excuse is nonsense on two levels. First, it is not true. Fake news, which is defined as stories which are verifiably false, had no discernible effect on the election. The top fake news stories of the election cycle were that the Pope endorsed Trump, ISIS endorsed Hillary, Hillary sold weapons to ISIS, James Comey received legal fees from the Clinton Foundation, and Pizzagate. There is, however, absolutely no evidence that these stories influenced people who were with her either to stay home or to vote for someone else. Furthermore, when pressed for examples of so-called fake news, Hillary has only ever complained about stories which are true. These stories include her violation of the national secrets laws, the unethical meeting between Bill Clinton and Loretta Lynch, the connections between donations to the Clinton Foundation and actions she took as Secretary of State, such as the selling of United States uranium assets to the Russian government, the money she took from Goldman Sachs, and the state of her health. Second, the reason why Hillary lost is she did not persuade unmarried women, millennials, and minorities that she cared about and planned to redress their economic stress. Hillary lost because she failed to address the facts that middle-class jobs don't pay enough, Taxes on the middle class are too high, and the middle class greatly resents that the banks, which caused the recession, were bailed out. Hillary should have stayed in the woods. She's done more than her fair share of damage already. The only reason why I delve into this matter is that there is, as we know, another layer to the story. This story does not begin and end with unspecified and unproven claims that the Russians hacked the election and spread fake news about Hillary. Sadly, the propagators are also insisting that Trump was in collusion with the Russians. Oddly, they have never specified what they mean by collusion, nor have they produced a shred of evidence to support their claim. Yet the so-called news media is amplifying the story as if it is a fact. In fact, when the story was initially propagated, James Clapper, who was the administrator of Obama's spying services, admitted that there is no evidence of any collusion between Trump and the Russians. We did not include any evidence in our report that had anything that had any reflection of collusion between members of the Trump campaign and the Russians. There was no evidence of that included in, in our report. I understand that, but does it exist? N not to my knowledge. It's clear that the Russians interfered and did so in an attempt to help Donald Trump. Do you still believe that conclusion? Yes, I do. But at this point, what's not proven is the idea of collusion. That's correct. Mind you, it's odd that Clapper is proffered as the credible expert in this propaganda. While he had a distinguished career in Air Force intelligence, he is best known for blatantly lying to Congress about the NSA spying on Americans. 
does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not? Not wittingly. There are cases where they could in inadvertently perhaps uh, collect, but not, not wittingly. In any event, after his initial admissions failed to fit the evolving narrative, he's been in retreat and revision. Now in a semantic game, he claims that he never meant that there was no evidence of collusion. Now he claims that he meant only that he did not know of any evidence. Here he is explaining on CNN. The president says, you said there was no collusion. Is that a fair depiction? My statements should not be considered exculpatory, is to use a legal term. Bottom line is, I don't know if there was collusion, political collusion, uh, uh, and I don't know of any evidence to it, so I can't, I can't refute it and I can't, I can't confirm it. And here he is back on Meet the Press. There was no evidence that came, that rose to that level at that time uh, that found its way into the intelligence community assessment, which we had pretty high confidence in. That's not to say there wasn't evidence, uh, uh, but not that met that threshold. The important takeaway from this is that no evidence whatsoever has ever been produced that Trump colluded with the Russians. Artful equivocations by a professional liar do not suffice as proof. Moreover, from the fact that Trump's enemies are so obviously keen to get him, it is fair to infer that if they had any evidence of collusion, we'd know it by now. Like Clapper, Obama's CIA director, John Brennan, admitted to Congress that there is no evidence of collusion. He also admitted that he doesn't even know what the propagandists mean by collusion. When you learned of Russian efforts, did you have evidence of a connection between the Trump campaign and Russian state actors? As I said, Mr. Gowdy, I don't do evidence. As I said, Mr. Gowdy, I don't do evidence. Evidence, evidence, evidence. That's the word that my fellow citizens understand. Did evidence exist? Did evidence exist of collusion, coordination, conspiracy between the Trump campaign and Russian state actors? I don't know whether or not such collusion, and that's your term, such collusion existed. I don't know. Of course, we also know that the FBI is conducting an investigation. James Comey disclosed this to Congress, although he never specified what crimes the FBI is investigating. The FBI as part of our counterintelligence mission, is investigating the Russian government's efforts to interfere in the 2016 presidential election. And that includes investigating the nature of any links between individuals associated with the Trump campaign and the Russian government, and whether there was any coordination between the campaign and Russia's efforts. Aside from some generalized conspiracy, which may or may not transgress the criminal law, it appears that there are two possible crimes. The first would be a Logan Act violation. This law prohibits private citizens from negotiating with a foreign government over a dispute that government has with the United States. This is a difficult case to make. Moreover, there has only ever been one person indicted under this law. That was in 1803, and that blatantly political case was dismissed immediately after the indictment was filed. The second would be a violation of the sanctions Obama imposed on Russia. These sanctions were of two types. The first prohibited Americans from exporting oil drilling equipment and technology to Russia. This is unlikely to have any application to Trump. The second prohibited Americans from accepting secured loans from Russian banks. This kind of case would be fairly easy to prove. These loans are in writing. There would be a contract, a lien on record, and most likely a payment history. The FBI would be able to reconstruct the record of such a transaction. However, Trump has too many good lawyers to ever have entered into such a deal. Many have become hysterical that Trump fired Comey after Comey would not drop the investigation of Michael Flynn. They urge that this is consciousness of guilt and an effort by Trump to obstruct justice. This, however, leads nowhere. The FBI's investigation continues. Furthermore, Comey has already admitted under oath that he has never been pressured politically to give up an investigation. 
So if the Attorney General or senior officials at the Department of Justice opposes a specific investigation, can they halt that FBI investigation? Yes. Has it happened? Not in my experience. I'm talking about a situation where we were told to stop something for a political reason. That would be a very big deal. It's not happened in my experience. In conclusion, this episode should be seen for what it is, an exercise in propaganda, an exercise to undermine the public's confidence in the election. It should give us all pause. If this exercise proves anything, it is that propaganda works. Even a demonstrably false story can become the consensus truth in the body politic if the propagators have a monopoly on the media outlets and the people are not sufficiently suspicious of the claims being made. I'd like to believe that the public is cynical enough not to fall for obvious manipulations. Unfortunately, the American public's gullibility appears to be limitless. I am concerned that by the time the Trump-Russia collusion story dies from lack of proof, the propagators will have a new story with which to distract and divide the public. I am concerned that too few people will take the time to recognize the deliberate effort to deceive them and will instead continue to respond to cynical appeals to their biases. I am concerned that too few people will recognize that the artificial divisions in the public is how the 1% perpetuates the status quo, which nearly everyone in the 99% agrees is unacceptable. There hasn't been that smoking gun. There hasn't been that smoking gun yet. At what point should the public start to wonder this is all just smoke? Well, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know.